welcome back to the podcast. Today we have a very special guest with us. We have Brittany Nicholson. Almost called you by your maiden name then. That was so close. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. Um, now, I'm going to let you tell us your very long list of qualifications, but Britt is very educated in the field of psychology. So please let us know um, your study background and then I'll introduce the topic. All right. Amazing. Thanks so much for having me. So, um, yeah, like Tani said, I have an extensive debt, aka <laughs> a list of degrees, um, but it's more the debt I focus on now. But basically I, um, I left high school and started studying psychology. Yes, I did a Bachelor of Psych. I then um, started doing like fourth year psychology and then um, – my husband was also studying at the time and, and I considered, I thought, I'm really sick of being poor and being a student is a little bit depressing. Yeah. So um, they had like this course that was expiring in Queensland, which was you could become a teacher in eight months if you already had an undergrad. So I was like, sweet, I'll be a teacher. They get paid 400 bucks a day for casual work. Yeah. I don't want to be a teacher. They're losers. <laughs> um, but I'll make 400 bucks a day while I continue studying psych. So I smashed out the degree in eight months. It was super fast. And then I was like, I'm not going to teach. I'll just casually do it. And then I will keep studying so I can become a psychologist. So um, I got offered this job at like a really esteemed school. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. I'll just do it for one year. I'll just be a psych teacher for one year. Yeah. And then I fell in love with it. And all this like pride that I had around teaching being lame and yes. not smart was like completely abolished and I like had a massive dissonance within myself but loved it yeah absolutely loved teaching psychology I worked just with their year 10 11 and 12 students so just the seniors and um and just fell in love with teaching psych so I did that for a long time and yes I kept studying psychology while I was working um because you're crazy because we're crazy yeah because I was like I'm gonna do this and then I yeah. just kept doing it anyway so I did that for like a long time and then I ended up just finishing my master's in um, school-based counselling so I can work with specifically with adolescents. And that's what I'm doing now. So, yeah, like completely diverted me away from what I thought I wanted, yeah. but I'm glad I am where I am because I'm way happier. I would have yeah. probably been quite miserable in clinical practice just because it is quite isolating. And Yeah, you know, absolutely. Being, like, team. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, it's funny that, it's hey, like I sort of – it's somewhat similar I mean I lecture now and now I'm like freelancing educating <laughs> yeah. like yeah. It, because it is really fulfilling you know so I totally I love it totally agree on that front um and and like especially like you've, I know you have a lot of international viewers but the money in education I'll just speak to Queensland but it's quite similar across mm. all Australian states is like double to triple what you make yeah in, in like I'm on six figures now as a school counselor, Incredible. and I work forty weeks of the year. Yeah, so it's like it, it's, it's hard. It's hard it's to say. So no good. I think you're right. Like it's a really lot hard. of my followers are from the United States. I think seventy percent of my following is from the United States, and then I've got people from all around, like um, lots from the UK, lots from uh, Sweden, Norway, all sorts. And I know in the states, in well, in some states of the United States teachers definitely aren't super well paid no um so that's really something low. that we can brag about here in australia <laughs> our taxes not so much but <laughs> our teachers get paid well um and we have great health care so there's that too yeah you just have to definitely. put up with like, some move on over yeah you just have to put up with some <laughs> statewide flooding and the occasional cataclysmic wildfire you know <laughs> that's all right get insurance and you'll be fine. yeah 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 um so Thank you. That was awesome. So yeah, as just, you can tell, Britt is very um, well versed and studied. And I, I asked her if she'd like to come on the podcast and talk about the history of psychology. And then um, once we sort of established that, then kind of, uh, I didn't know how to explain it, but I was like, maybe we could like travel back in time and have a look at some like a traumatic event and, and like, see what people would have been dealing with psychologically so that was my premise to Brittany and so we're just gonna blow and chat and we'll just see where we go so um I guess my own my first and probably most structured question is give us the rundown where did psychology begin the way that we study it today and like all of that 
Yeah, so this is um, it's interesting because psychology has gotten a bad rap <laughs> as, versus all the other sciences. And this is definitely something that I dealt with in the staff room with all the chemistry and physics right, stuff, and right. they were all like, "You're just a pity science. Yeah. You're not real." <laughs> like the term pseudoscience gets thrown around, and and I think like when you review the history of psychology, like I can, I understand. Gotcha, so, gotcha. So like. When we look at like ancient, because I know you guys love history, yes. when you look at like ancient Greeks, we look at like at your key philosophers and you yep. look at like your Aristotle and your Descartes. And so a lot of like early kind of philosophies around psychology actually stem from philosophy. Yeah. So yep. um, the idea of like the mind versus body problem or the mm-hmm. um, kind of like there is there a God or is there a spiritual, mm-hmm. that kind of concept was a key, I guess, foundational question that started psychology yeah awesome. so psychology as we know it today like only started 200 years ago mm. so philosophy's been around for thousands yes yeah but it was never able to actually be tested mm-hmm. like your ability to test whether somebody had a soul or whether <laughs> the mind and body were the same thing like i mean we still test them, no we? no it's funny though <laughs> like uh, on my history class today we actually were studying the ancient greece for philo- ancient greek philosophers so we were going through aristotle oh, and socrates yeah so it's the timing is fantastic and um one Perfect. of the biggest questions or uh one of the things we covered today was like polis or their cities being a part of their spirituality as and you're exactly right mm. like you can't test that <laughs> it's not really a science no. per se it's just a a thought-provoking question and concept so yeah i totally understand what you mean so, like, so then in, like, the late 1800s, a guy called William Wong basically said, no, nah, I am going to test it. Yeah. Like, I'm going to figure out a way to test it. And he opens a lab and he calls it psychology. Mm-hmm. And he looks a little bit about that, like, introspection, like, thinking about thinking, yeah. trying to get into, like, uh, I mean, there are a lot of Eastern religions that had been doing this for hundreds of years prior to psychology, but he wanted to take it from, like, a clinical perspective. Sure. So a lot of early psychologists are doctors first. Yes, and they gotcha. At things that were more intangible. So, like Freud was a doctor. Yeah, like sure. Most of them are doctors because there was nothing that like he couldn't study psychology. Yeah, so like I mean, psychiatry didn't quite exist either. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yep. They wanted to study like human behavior and how it changed. So, late eighteen hundreds that kind of kicked off, and then the mid nineteen hundreds, around like early nineteen hundreds, World War One, World War Two. Mm-hmm. That's when the university started allowing people to do research through them, like your big, uh, English, like UK universities, big American unis. Yep. And that's when they started doing a lot of those, like, unethical yeah. psychological experience. Interesting. So, yep. so, yeah, so, like, they were, it was very experimental and it very much, like, merged between philosophy and medicine and sure. it kind of really sat in between. And I think, like, arguably today psychology still sits between the two theories sure. I mean we're definitely pushing more to like the scientific method and psychiatry perspective yeah but um yeah it still tries to answer a lot of things that we can't talk about and like yeah it just depends what school of thought you want but yeah, yeah basically like late 1800s let's figure out why we are the way we are and yeah. then to today which is what can I measure? What can I test? What can I assess? What can I do in a lab? Yeah. And if you can't do those things, it kind of is like, uh, we won't touch it. Yeah, so- interesting. It's it's interesting as well, like you mentioned, and I, I want to give voice to, like you said, like non-Western, non-Western traditions have been doing this and have concept of the soul and the spirit for so many hundreds of years. And then, mm. yeah, it is interesting that World War One and World War Two gave that opportunity uh, like maybe not in the most ethical way possible well, actually no like some of those experiments were insane like and then really insane. yeah so did freud come prior to um oh are you still there yeah your oh camera. sorry my okay. camera's just switched off your camera okay all good um no. so did freud come before or after the wars so he was early 1900s so he was kind of involved okay. but he lived he had quite a long career and I was like just looking up before because I remember reading some early stuff about Freud I don't know the universities really hate on Freud but the more that I'm in practice like learning about psychoanalytics the more I respect what he did but sure basically Freud really wanted to be famous 
Okay. Really wanted to. Like, I remember reading his memoirs and he's like, I want to do something big. Like, I want to win a Nobel Prize. Yeah, right. Um, and so he was, like, really keen. And I remember he, the first, one of the big studies that he did is he, like, wanted to extract, like, an insane amount of sperm from eels. <laughs> I don't really remember why he did it, but, like, I'm talking, like, thousands of what? sperm from, like, hundreds of eels. And he wanted to see, like, what he could find out about it. So he just right. was picking, like, really, like, bizarre remember, stuff. Like, like, yeah, okay. He wanted to pick, like, really weird stuff and um he kind of like was the original father of clickbait then like if i do weird then it will be wonderful (laughs) and in like the early 1900s people were like sex this shall never be spoken of yeah yeah very like controversial yeah but he went he didn't make it with the eels no why but like people just weren't super interested in eel sperm no Um, i can yeah i can understand why (laughs) <laughs> oh, what a waste of time. Oh, no. um, yeah, and like not cute work either. Like, what a waste of time. Could it be easy? No. He, like, hand dissected them all. Oh, gosh. Ooh. Anyway, past Freud. eels. Freud. So then he, um, he got given a lot of women that had what was called at the time hysteria. Sure. So yes. Okay, let's talk we, about we'll this. Talk about, yeah, so like what I would probably think it is today yeah. where some of his clients might be like people that are experiencing like manic episodes, like yeah. something with like maybe bipolar, yeah. people that are experiencing just generalized psychosis. Sure. Um, also women that were just quite erratic. Yeah. Like, okay. May not even be diagnosable yet, but their husbands are like, they're not conforming to the kitchen. Yeah, absolutely. I read this like meme. I think I posted on my Instagram and it was like, women in the 1800s have four babies and zero orgasms in four years. Wonder why they're hysteric. <laughs> yeah. So they just like have this broad overarching term for hysteria. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and like, we even have things like post birth psychosis and things like that that we know about now and there's like a lot that happens to a woman's body yeah i don't know why the men never got this but the women specifically were hysterical yeah so their husbands would send them to freud to get treated right because he's a doctor yeah and what he found is that talk therapy or just literally listening to the woman actually helps them a lot surprise surprise (laughs) what a concept Stay away from the sperm and talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just listening actually helps. Psychotic. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I would probably say, like, a lot of those women may not have had, like, a biological undertone as to why they were hysterical. They were probably just, like, quite oppressed. Yeah, sure. In their own life. Yes. So he was kind of, like, the father of talk therapy, and, and he is the one that looked a lot at, like, how unconscious and, sure. and why – why like our defense mechanisms and why we are the way we are which is still used in certain types of therapy now but I do think that like from my university studies it, it is given it's not it's kind of a bit of a joke like I don't sure think he is a joke but there's a lot of like negative stigma around Freud no I like and- as someone not in the field I only know jokes about Freud like the yeah the, 100% it's your mum problems or your dad problems and that's kind of my only concept of Freud is a joke, which is interesting. So, like, why? <laughs> why is that? I think, like, I think it's because, and this is where I think psychology gets that bad name, because most people only know Freud, right? Yeah. Like, he's, like, I don't know. He's the clickbait king. Yeah. So everyone knows Freud. And I and he was he was really interested in, in like, our psychoanalytical theory, so things beyond the consciousness. So, like, I've seen a diagram, and it's like an iceberg. Sure. And then there's like your water level and the below. And, and basically like what most clinicians will work out now is like you're above the surface stuff. Mm. Like why are you feeling stressed? Why are you feeling anxious? Then you have that water level. And then below, which yeah. is like, you know, 70% of the iceberg is like, well, what's causing you to feel anxious? Yeah, like, beyond absolutely. what you can consciously recognize. Yeah. And the truth is a lot of that like early childhood interactions that you may not be conscious of can definitely impact you. Yeah. So... He got a lot of hate because it's not scientific. You know, like, sure. how can I test your early childhood? How can I measure that? How can I quantify it? How sure. can I use that? So you can't. No. So it's like, so that's where the, I think. Which the, is like, funny, right? Because, yeah. like, we, at least in my experience of therapy and 
the different exposures that I've had, that is a genuine thing that's discussed, like your childhood, the way you were raised, da, da, da. And that seems very valid. So that is actually really bizarre that we maybe, Mm. did it maybe just come from it being odd at the time and then the jokes have just continued on? (laughs) Like, Yeah, and I think, like, Freud had one of his most, um, like, famous mm. um like theories is like our psychosexual stages uh, and like it yes. talks about like how babies like always put things in their mouth that's like oral sex and that's like gotcha. you know that's like their need for like sexualization and he sexualized every stage of like childhood development up until gotcha. 12. and I think people were like what the hell is wrong with you like a baby yeah. sucking on toys isn't sexual yes and I just yeah. think people stuck to that theory or absolutely like that's how it was perceived to me at uni like yeah. they never were like let's look at the unconscious or like even you know the like angel and like devil on the shoulders yeah yeah you know that like that's a freudian concept oh. which i think is like yeah so that's like your ego and your id and super ego and that's huh. like it's always in like movies and tv show and i almost think they like humorize yeah quite i'm like an intellectual concept i'm thinking like um, what's what's the Cusco Emperor's New Groove? Like, yeah, crom, 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 like with no, like the... <laughs> is that who it is? Yeah. <laughs> that's so interesting. And now that you say, it, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. It's like, uh, like the jokes are like, oh, it's just because you want to have sex with your mother or like whatever. But yeah. that's like super fascinating. That's maybe so. Maybe his more polarizing stuff has become laughable, and so then he's like discredited as like, but like in reality, then his his ideas really are the basis of where we kind of began. Yeah, I would say, like, even though there were researchers before him, no one kind of made psychology as well known as him. Yeah, gotcha. There's a reason you know who he is and you don't know who William Want is. Oh, 100%. Like, well, that's it, yeah, like, that's right? Why. Yeah, 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 that's super 100%. interesting. Um, so from Freud, then, then we're, where are we going from there? So then that's when a lot of universities started recognising it as like a subject area. So that's when you start going to a lot of those unethical studies. So Mm. a big psychology growth period was post-World War II. So a lot of soldiers and families were obviously experiencing a lot of psychological distress, potentially trauma, PTSD, all things that we would see like, oh, duh, like, of course, that's what you're facing now. But they didn't have, like, a diagnostic manual. They didn't Mm. necessarily, like, could categorize symptoms. They didn't have any form of treatment. Um, And they couldn't necessarily explain some of, like, immoral actions that happened in the war either. Sure. So a lot of researchers were like, okay, this is, like, such a good like, let's explore this, you know, like mm. world events, things you've done that you would never normally do, like why are people doing them? So yeah. like, my favourite ever study was done in, like, 1963 by a guy called Stanley Milgram. Mm. And it was right after the Nazi, like, war trials were done. So obviously, like, they committed horrendous crimes mm-hmm. and they they needed to be, like, punished, basically, yeah. with how the world saw it. Yeah. So they went to court. And, like, all the people that were still alive, they were like, why did you kill, you know, thousands and thousands of people? Why did you do all these, like, horrendous crimes? And they said, oh, well, because we were told to. You know, like, you can't blame me. Mm. I was just following orders. Yep. I was just doing what I was told to do. My family was being threatened or I was right. doing it for Germany. Whatever, right? They yep. all have, like, these justifications of basically placing blame onto somebody else. Yeah, okay. And the court was basically like, well, that's cool. Yeah, like yeah. Trash. You're going to prison, or you're getting yeah. killed. Whatever. Yeah. Like the court was like, no, nah, not having it. Bar this. Yeah, you're done. Yeah. So they all got prosecuted, but this Stanley Milgram guy was like, "But what happens if that's the truth? Sure. Like, what happens if that is the real reason? So what he did, um, oh, gee, I can't remember the uni. It's like Oxford or Stanford or something yeah. like that. Yeah. He um only really men were at uni at the time. Mm. So he recruited, he just had like an ad and he was like, come do an experiment, it's a learning experiment. Um, I'll pay you, like, I don't know, it was like five pounds or something at the time. Yeah. Was, like, Nothing. Massive. Yeah. And they he recruited all these like white males, they're like 35-ish, and he did a study. So what he did is he said, we're going to do a learning experiment. We want to see if punishment is an effective way for them to learn. So the whole sure. study was a facade. But yeah. they didn't know that. So basically the gist of it is like the re like the participant that comes in mm-hmm. sits in front of a um like a one way glass thing, like like you've seen sure. in like FBI movies. 
So they're looking at somebody in another room who's strapped up to like electrical pads. Yeah. Like, so like, like some, basically. yeah, okay. So I can't remember, there's like some cords on them and they're sitting like in front of a big machine. So basically they say the person is going, you're going to ask them a question, like they were like kind of riddled, but just say like what colour is the sky is yeah. the question. If the person gets it wrong, you hit the button and that will give them 15 volts of electricity. Sure. Then if they get it right, you don't zap them and you just keep going consistently. Yeah. Now, the trick with the experiment is every 15 volts would be added. So it would be 15, 30, 45, 60 uh. until it got to 300 volts. And I remember when I was teaching this at class, in like the class, I was like, what does that mean? Like, yeah, I don't yeah. know what, what 300 is, volts yeah. mean. So I think I looked it up and it was something like 150 volts is like a knife in a toaster. Wow. Something like 200 volts is like an electric fence and wow. 300 volts is like you're dead. So like oh, gosh. anywhere from like 260 volts to 300, you're dead. You're dead, so, yeah. So these guys would have had like a decent understanding of electricity. Sure. Like this is like the 60s. Like yeah. most people are pretty hands on. Yeah. Um. So anyway, so they asked them like a series of questions and you can watch the footage. It's like it's pretty distressing wow but basically um the person that was on the other side getting like zapped would like scream and be really distressed um and basically there was a guy in the lab coat standing next to the person shocking yeah and if they were like look I don't want to do this anymore like I don't want to do it they'd be like you need to continue you need to keep going it's really important for the experiment yeah and I think it was 63 percent of people went to 300 volts. Wow. So if the person actually was shocked up, it was like an actor, but if they actually were shocked up, 63% of people would have killed a random person. Because they were told to. because they were asked to. Seriously. Yeah. That is 100%. And these are like white American middle class families that can afford to go to uni. Like they're not, we're talking yeah. like the average population here. Man. The, that's and they did it. And when asked, like, why did you do it? They said, well, because you told me to. Far and it's out. Like- <laughs> and so then, yeah, you look at, like, these awful things that have been done. And yeah. they, wow. And so that, that is insane, isn't it? it it's yeah, so. And then they replicated it in, like, the 80s or 90s at Melbourne Uni. And they found, like, the same result. Seriously. That's fascinating. Like, what? That is and everyone was like so traumatized after it and Yeah. Like, oh, come on. Gosh. Yeah, we well, shouldn't have electrocuted them, should you? Yeah, that is so fascinating. I have a thousand questions. <laughs> <laughs> um It's like my favorite study. Yeah, wow, that's that speaks so much to like I think it's so easy and coming back to like a historical point of view, I always kind of come and say it's so easy for us to pick on the past it's so easy for us mm. to be like oh well, you shouldn't have done that or and obviously not justifying whatsoever the stuff that happened in world war ii because it was a war crime like for good like yeah 100 percent. but in saying that like i can imagine the people potentially really did believe but i was just told to do it like yeah it, it's kind of and it's very um, contemporary because I'm seeing, I don't know about you if you've spent much time on social media recently, but we're watching like um, young troops being told mm. go into the Ukraine and then when they're like crying when these, you know, fully grown citizens that have taken up arms are like, why are you here? It's just like I was just ordered to come here, you know. It's yeah. like actually yeah. so relevant to our modern day. That like genuinely makes me terrified because mm. what do we do every day that we've just been told to do? Oh, and it's like <laughs> the more that I understand psychology, the more I just like am not surprised by anything. Like, no, yeah, like, that's like, so even, interesting. And the thing is as well, like even with like contemporary, like with the poor Russians and Ukrainians at the moment, is like they are actually genuinely threatened. Yeah. Like, they don't really have a choice. No. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they don't really have a choice. And in a lot of ways, like, I can't blame them either. Because, yeah. Like, it's either you or them. And I think, like, when you look at people that do stand up, and it's always the anomaly, like, the yeah. statistics on how often you'll stand up against the group, you have I, such, like, respect and they have such courage. Yes. Because as much as you want to sit there and think I would be that one, 
statistically <laughs> you wouldn't be. be. And, and what really is that theory? What is it? Is it? Is it uh, herd immune? Um, what is that theory called? Um, is it herd? Oh, is it just herd Which mentality? One? Isn't it? Um, yeah, 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 where you're like the literal ninety nine percent of people will just go with whatever the group is saying because it's uncomfortable. Even if they know it's wrong. Yes. Like, yeah. And this is like, this is a great, like they did a line experiment. This is so simple, but so powerful where they had like all actors bar one person mm -hmm. and they showed people three lines, like line, line, line. Yeah. And they said, which is the shortest line or which is the longest line? Like super easy. Like sure. we're not even like, oh, it's the two males. It was like very obviously that's the line yeah and they like had the legit participant at the end of the table and then like the other five people would be like a a a a a and it was like b yeah and then that person would be like huh huh what like it's it's definitely b and but they would say a interesting they were like well the rest of the group is doing it and like if you're willing to change your morals on something with your eyeballs that you can see, yeah, let's add the complexities of like fear, anxiety, yeah, pressure, like your background, more, your like past trauma, crazy. your ever yeah, that is yeah. so fascinating and explains so much. Like, you know, like I said, you can pick on history, but it's like, and we all want to believe that we would be the hero or heroine, but like, yeah, that's so interesting. That statistically, probably not. Um, yeah, uh, I think and we're more likely to protect the group than we are ourselves. That's interesting. Is, more yeah. likely to protect yeah. the group than ourselves. That's fascinating. Yep. It's a safety. It's a safety in group, and it's like you just create so much dissonance. Like, yeah, interesting. It's um, yeah, just we are not as moral and as brave as we'd like to think we are, and obviously not as individualistic as we. Like I know in many cultures throughout the world, we work in these interdependent villages basically. And I know yeah. in the West we've really attempted to isolate ourselves, you know, even just something as simple as having children. You, you know, back in maybe a village or like a simpler society or a non-Western society, you have mm. that the grandmother helps the mother, helps the daughter, helps the granddaughter, right? Or, you know, yeah. the male equivalent. And we've stepped so much outside of that that I suppose enter the Freudian period where you've got hysteria in all these women, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask... Uh, Damn, the question was really good too. It's gone. So heading back to um, the not so lovely uh, unethical studies, the, I don't know if you know this study, and I'm not sure if it's a lie, but I would like your input. No. <laughs> so um, I, I, I've heard this story, and it has literally freaked me out for years, that in World War II, they had this sleep experiment where they basically like derive people asleep. sleep. Is that real? Is that real? <laughs> know, this yeah, it. Yeah, and they like rip each other's bodies apart. Yeah, they out their organs and stuff. Yeah, it's not true. Okay, good. I, like, Thank I freaking goodness. And being like, I remember seeing this creepy ass video. Yes. I, like, I wonder if. And I was like really creepy. I wonder if I actually like, maybe. <laughs> Because I remember seeing the same thing. And fun fact, everyone, me and Brittany grew up together. Um, so uh, I wonder if maybe that's why we both have seen this one thing. But, yeah, that has scared me for years. I just had to clear it up quickly. Do not. Yeah, no, I was, like, really creeped out by it. But they did do legit sleep studies in, like, oh, damn, I don't know if all my dates are right. Like, you guys can hate me in the comments. If I'm wrong. But I think it was, like, the 80s or 90s. Yeah. And this guy, he was, like, a DJ, like a you know, an old school DJ, but he wanted to, he was on like a radio show and he wanted to raise money for something. Yeah. So he said he was going to go like, I think it was like, like a sleep weeks strike. without sleep. Oh my goodness. And he did it. Like, I actually don't know how he physically did it, but he did, it's like the world record of Oh my not gosh. Sleep. And he, um, he like lost his mind. Yeah. Like wow. permanently. So oh, he wow. had like a really success. Yeah. Like it's like just, he snapped. He snapped, I, yeah. He had, like, a marriage, he had kids. He was, like, really successful. 
And then afterwards, he became like really aggressive. His like marriage broke down. He wow. like couldn't see his kids anymore. Like it just like it permanently screwed him up. But wow. that's the only like, sleep study that's actually legit. Okay, good. I just yeah. like as you were talking I've never about heard it. Of him. He did go like loopy during the time. Like, sure, he was you know like delirious, associating and yeah, yeah, yeah. But he didn't like rip out his own organs. Yes, okay, because that was like I, as you were talking about the Germany study, I was like, <gasps> I was like the sleep study that haunted me as a young child. Um, so that's so interesting. So how far have we come? with the theories right like so Mm. we now know or at least in like I said in my experience being the um therapy no the the person getting the therapy (laughs) um and what I know of like uh like CBT and you know talk therapy and all of that so much is like our childhood our the way we were raised our religion the area we live in so much of it matters so where are we like scientifically Mm. with Mm. that so I think like where we're at in like practice so Mm -hmm. like let like stay away from the research now and like let's just look at like what's in practice I think it it does depend on the clinician like everyone has their own opinion so I'll just give you mine yeah but um there are like a bunch of therapies, like you said, yeah. CBT, ACT, DBT, ICDP, like yes. they're all acronyms and lots of different clinicians use different therapies sure. depending on, especially like the diagnosis. So like somebody with borderline personality disorder might really benefit from DBT, whereas mm. somebody with anxiety might really benefit from CBT. So like that's sure. where like you being a pro and knowing what your client needs is good. Yes. Um, yeah. Most therapies, Western therapies, mm-hmm um sit in that conscious level yeah um and they look at like what's triggering you today how could we fix that tomorrow sure. what actions could you take that kind of stuff yeah um there are a few psychoanalytical theories which look at the unconscious mm-hmm. um in like queensland gold coast specifically i know of maybe two practices that do that so very rare like what you learn in uni is cbt ACT, act like conscious bread and level stuff yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. and, and i feel like really yeah but for some people and one of the like key defense mechanisms is intellect intellectualization which is Mm -hmm. like thinking through everything Mm -hmm. and if you are that kind of person and you overthink things or you can rationalize things like well the reason that they acted badly to me is because they had a trauma upbringing sure the reason that they whatever you like yeah. you talk yourself through it mm-hmm. then something like cbt you'll run rings around your therapist <laughs> because you'll just over insulate like the whole thing yeah yeah something like icpt which is a like a psychodynamic theory is really effective like that because they'll be like okay let's stop yeah you're over intellectualizing this let's see what you're trying to mask let's see what kind of feeling you're trying to to uh, over rationalize interesting yeah. it's funny i'm laughing because Brittany and i have had this conversation because my psychiatrist has given me exposure therapy and i am an over i'm an over thinker so this is thank you for explaining that because i haven't even had the chance <laughs> to look into it but yeah i do that all the time i'm like but this, but this, but this, but this. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then, <laughs> and then I find people, like, won't benefit from therapy. Yes. And then it's such yes. a shame, yes. right? It's such a shame because, and this is kind of the thing that, I, like, this is a personal pet peeve of me with CBT, mm-hmm. is I feel like you're, um, uh, like, you're addressing a symptom, right? Like, right. Like, yes. if you think medically, you're like, oh, I have eczema or I have gut mm-hmm. issues or I have, I don't know, acne. Yeah. And then we go, okay, well, let's chuck a steroid on it. Let's yeah. give you an antibiotic, whatever. But you're not ever, like, addressing what's giving you yeah, got the problem. Yeah, got you. And so I find, like, even if CBT, like, for example, CBT might really, really affect you if you're, like, you're an alcoholic. Yes. But then sometimes what can happen is they'll find something else to be addicted to. So Absolutely. you've, like, replaced one coping behavior with another. Yeah. And that's kind of my pet peeve is I'm like, well, if we could just get to the deep, deep, painful, painful mm. root of what you're trying to mask, 
absolutely then you're not going to find a replacement behavior and that's like that's absolutely. my personal opinion yes but yeah. like a lot of people are benefiting from lots of different types of therapy yeah but for me as an over intellectualizer that I helps need- yeah which for <laughs> someone <laughs> that <laughs> suffers the absolute opposite of that it could be the worst advice in the world which obviously is why <laughs> it's important to have a qualified <laughs> person to be yeah. able to find what's good for you and you know my psychiatrist that i spend a lot of money on and i'm very privileged mm. to be able to do so it, he speaks about that with myself that he calls it the um the uh what is that the hamster thing the hit the you know at the arcade where the like the hamster oh, comes out and you like hit it and the then the next one pops thing. up yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how he speaks yeah, about yeah. addiction it's like unless we get to the yeah. root of the addiction it's like one addiction goes down one addiction pops up which is yeah yeah i'm glad that you know it sounds like he knows what he's talking about <laughs> yeah 100 um, and like i honestly like this is just my again my opinion but i genuinely believe that everybody would and should benefit from therapy absolutely. and i think like i genuinely think if you're like oh but i haven't had a bad upbringing or i haven't i don't think there's anything wrong with me oh there's something wrong yeah, yeah yeah we'll find it <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yes there's just something you're just hanging around with people that probably have the same problems um, and that in, i'm them. so glad you said that and <laughs> and at least personally the more i've understood about my own psychology and from the outset i am one of those people that say that i've had a beautiful upbringing my parents are mm-hmm. loving i'm in a wealthy country you know tick 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 but yeah, I'm messed up in the head, <laughs> as is, and I believe personally that that's the human condition, right? Like, to yeah. be a human is to struggle with one's mind, and I think it was Aristotle that said, "A mind unanalyzed is a life not lived," mm. which is just like mm. a nice little like print that on a t-shirt. But anyway, um, yeah, hundred percent. So I, I agree. I think everyone, and, and the more I've learned about my own mind, the more empathetic I am to others. I think the more you understand mm-hmm. how your environment and psychological factors really do impact your actions, you can kind of hold space for others more because you're like, oh. yeah. It's like, for example, yesterday at work, we had this lady ring in and she was, irate like she was just the client was just insanely irate um yeah yeah and and like I feel like I was able to sit there and be like okay I can see the suburb that she's in she's flooded I can hear three children in the background she's stressed and so this tiny little issue that she's called in about is like the colleague that was taking the phone call that I was listening to He's just the sounding board. And lo and behold, today she emails in completely apologizing for her actions. But I feel like unless we kind of educate ourselves about that, then you're kind of like, she's just a bit rah, 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 rah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And then what happens is it ruins your whole day. Yes. Then you start rationalizing like, yes. oh, did I actually do something wrong? Yep. Oh, what could I have done different? And then you what tell three other people yep. how crap that experience was, and it just it ruins your whole day. And then you Absolutely. swing your crap on everyone else. Absolutely. What and then you're just that complaining. Like you just yeah, you're just this complaining, and then complaining becomes a habit, and then that becomes your reality. And yeah, that's so fascinating. Yeah. I think it, you. I love and you're that. Like, I don't have a problem. I don't need therapy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a perfect life, but I'm constantly complaining. <laughs> that's so interesting. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think like every time, every time people like tell me like their sucks, I'm always like, uh, the therapy? <laughs> literally, like I, 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 I'm gonna throw my mom. I adore my mom; she's the best mom. But I'm throwing her under the bus here. I'm like, I'm always like, now, mom, this week I've been do- watching some YouTube videos. Let's talk about your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Let's unpack that. Level. Let's unpack Let's that. I'm like, have you heard of childhood grooming? <laughs> or just like whatever, you know, I've heard of the week. Um, so oh, let's. But yeah. So, yeah, I I wanted to ask. So you were saying we obviously have the therapy that sits on this conscious level. Mm-hmm. And you were saying at the beginning, you know, sometimes people can see psychology as like a quote unquote pseudoscience. Um, yeah. Obviously, the practices that we have are proven 
in clinic to work. So on yeah, that conscious 100%. on that conscious level, we have proven data to be like, if you suffer with general anxiety disorder, we can do this treatment and it will help. Or we can, yeah. um, if, I guess if you're in psychiatry, we can give you this medication and it is X percent helpful. But what about, yeah. what about the subconscious? Where are, like, that's fascinating. Um, where mm. are we mm. with that? Like, do we, what so do we know? The therapies. Some of the therapies, like the one I was talking about, ISDTP, that does have, like, studies to mm. show how effective it is. Like, you might not be able to measure, like, the milligrams and then, like, how effective it is. But everything in psychology is still subjective. It's all what's yeah. called self-report data. So it's, like, how much better do you think you're feeling on a scale of yes. 1 to 10? So we can do that with, like, both types of therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, like, then you're adding medication to the mix as well, which yeah. can, like create more problems slash be really effective like yeah. I've worked with clients that really love their medication know yes. when they're on it know when they're not on it and then I've also had other clients who were like I just feel worse for being on it so interesting I do think like with any like with any like I, the way that I always see is a little bit more like medicine like even though it works for the majority it might not necessarily work for you but that's about like tailoring and going back and like working absolutely through. yeah um yeah. Which further speaks to your Wait, point yeah. that therapy is for everyone because <laughs> you're only going to find that out for yourself with it working through it, right? Yeah, and, and one of the interesting um, things that I've learned myself in therapy is um, the more well you become, the more you'll be able to identify unwell behaviours. Interesting. And I think um, I think that that's like that speaks to it as well as I can almost spot people that get therapy now interesting yeah they use no, kind of like similar language yeah and they, um i think it, it does uh like it just goes back to early psychology as well like it makes you more introspective yeah you can kind of start seeing your own triggers seeing your own defense mechanisms yeah i call my husband on it all the time like yeah right right because right, um, right. he's psych trained as well and i'll be like oh well that's just the defense mechanism what are you really mean yeah like, oh, yes. no. like, how do you mad. really feel yeah no absolutely yeah. or uh, yeah just being <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Or like, why are you upset about this simple thing? Is, is something deeper going on? Like, <laughs> yeah, and then he's like, and you never want to unpack it because it no. hurts. And this is like the, the overarching thing is like we create defense mechanisms mm-hmm. to protect ourselves from feeling an emotion. So yeah. like an emotion might be sadness or anger. And but I think oh, this is something. Oh, this is like just what I've been really interested in recently is um we. It's almost like there becomes a point, and it's because I work with adolescents, somewhere mm-hmm. around year seven, eight or nine, which is yeah. 14 to 15, that feeling feelings becomes a bad thing. So, like, uh, when you, like, are with a toddler, right, or a baby, and they cry, mm-hmm. go, oh, like, you're hurting, let me help you. Yeah. Or a little kid slips and grazes their knee, oh, you're hurting. Or they're having a really crappy day, and they're like, oh, I feel really sad. And like, it's okay to feel sad, you know, like. That's yes, fine. yes. And then I find that somewhere in early time, Team that mm. we go you're weak if you're crying hmm. why are you being angry you don't have control over your feelings like somehow not feeling Feel- yeah makes right us better yeah and i've noticed like working with young kids who are 12 13 they'll come in crying she didn't invite me to her sleepover i'm really yeah. sad yeah you ask a 20 year old why are you upset at tani yeah oh, she's just a bitch yeah you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah you can't say i feel sad because she I feel things. left that's out. My feelings. Yeah. yeah, that's so yeah, interesting. So we we start like layering and layering and layering, and then by the time we're in adulthood, we can't even recognize what we feel. Anymore. Yeah, like we become numb to you our just, own feelings. We're just yeah. like, oh yeah, we just throw that on back onto the person, or oh, they're just incompetent at work. Yes, or, yes. Um, I just I hate them. I don't want them in my life anymore. But it's yeah. like, what what are you actually feeling? And I yeah, think like interesting. that's something like that I'm. Yeah, trying to be a bit more conscious of because working with little kids, they're so good at it. And yeah. Somewhere in our teen years, we're told it's not okay to feel anymore. And that's where I think a lot of the problems start. Fascinating. That is so interesting. In, in one of the psychological models that I've found really helpful, um, you literally go through this two week course of like learning vocabulary of how to express what you're feeling, right? And yeah, it, yeah. it legitimately you have these new words and you're like, oh, this feeling, I did not realize that's what it was. I just thought I was anxious. Like that was the one word that I had. And then yeah. it's like you anxious actually. Anxious or angry. 
Anxious or angry feeling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just don't know. I don't know. And then, yeah, really learning that vocabulary again. It's like, okay, no, I'm actually just excited yeah. uh, or I'm nervous about this particular. Yeah. So that's super fascinating that that switch happens. And do you think that that is just cultural? Do you think it's just because we learn like, oh, don't cry in public because people will do whatever I think you're weak or yeah you're... is that like a cultural thing do you think or I I know that it happens cross-culturally like yeah okay like there's an I don't know of one culture where they're really like okay with their feelings yeah yeah um but I 100% think it's because of our culture yeah 100% think it's our yeah. upbringing and like one of the other things that I think is pretty powerful is to be able to recognize what physiological changes are occurring when you're feeling that emotion sure so like Anxiety will be like you're sick in the stomach, sweaty yeah. palms, yeah, heart okay. palpitations. You, but like we just go, oh, like we just like oh. it's just too much. And yeah, we don't feel it. Or sad is like you feel like it's like coming up and like you, yeah. like, you know, like filling you up. But yeah. we just go, oh, I don't feel that, don't feel that. But it's like we are having a physiological response. It's, just, it's genuinely yeah. happening, and us uh, depressing, yeah. and it's making us sick. It's something that I've heard is that the the worst thing you can feel is a feeling, and like mm. it really, mm. we are so afraid of feeling that we cause ourselves so much pain. When in reality, if we just felt sad for those few moments, yeah, like sometimes crying and being sad feels really good. Like I don't know, yeah. I've list, I've watched sad movies and read sad books, and I'm like sitting there weeping, and I'm like, it, it's it's almost pleasurable to be sad. So like, but we mm. avoid being sad so much. If we just felt it, then we would like so much suffering would go out the window. But I mean, yeah. But even if you just think about like sad movies when they mm. like uh, dramatize, you know, the girl eating ice cream and crying. Yeah, she's weak. She's yes. broken. Yes. You know, she's not the hero of the story. Yes. Like, when are we ever celebrating that? Yeah. You know, like, that's what I do with my clients. I'm like, that's awesome that you're feeling sad. Yeah, I'm that's I'm so beautiful. glad that you can recognize that. Like, and do we do it with our kids or we just go, shh, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah, stop so crying. Stop so crying. Cry. Yeah. You know, we do Seriously. It. We do. We do. We do. That's so fascinating. We sit in the feeling with them. You know? mm. We just you- sit here with you while you cry. Do you think, um, like, obviously you're very in touch with the current teens, like, with your work. Do you think that's changing? Because I notice, like, obviously we're both on TikTok um, and, and like, that's a younger audience. And I notice that sort of my generation, our generation down, there seems to be so much more, well, I don't know, it seems like there's so much more understanding of, like, these basic principles. Mm. Do you think there's that change in the younger generation or is not quite yet? I think they're more educated as a whole. Like, they're very aware of diagnosis. A lot of them are already in therapy. A lot of them might already be medicated. They're very aware of the process. Sure. Do I think that they're better at identifying triggers and defense mechanisms? No, yeah, but how sure. could they be if most people don't know that? Absolutely, you know? yeah, like how and maybe are you supposed to know that, yeah, and maybe that comes with maturity. So it's like, well, maybe not maturity, but yeah, like further learning, maybe into yeah. like your own triggers yeah. and all of that. That's in- that's an interesting insight. Um, but they're definitely more educated on psych, like sure. for sure. Yeah, like. Yeah. Like what on my like TikToks, I'll be like, guess the diagnosis and they're guessing stuff. Like yeah. halfway through my undergrad, I wouldn't have known what they know. Interesting. So, interesting. Way more educated. Yeah. Okay. That's super interesting. Like you said before, BPD, that's still something that I don't quite understand, but I'm sure teens today might be able to guess that diagnosis. Like, like you said yeah, on TikTok. Sure. Um, what do you think about, um, uh, just I, you know, probably the scene I'm thinking of, but older generations that are uh, that look at diag- the diagnosis of all this depression and all this anxiety as a bad thing. Like they'll, they'll oh, be like, yeah. "Oh, you know, everyone's got anxiety today," and every. What do you say to that? Like, what is your take on it? 
Well, it's interesting because like things like anxiety, ADHD, depression, we've seen massive spikes through like over the last yep. 10, 15, 20 years. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. If you look, look across country in the US, the East, so like your New York, Philadelphia, has like exorbitantly more diagnosis and mm-hmm. medication than the West, like your California. And so it begs the question, which I think the question answers your question, are people just more ill in the East mm-hmm. or are we overdiagnosing? Sure. And I think that that answers the question. I don't think we're any more depressed or anxious than we were 30 years ago. Yeah. But I also don't think we were helping, we were seeking help as much as we are now. Well, well we that's weren't it, medicating right? or we weren't getting therapy. Yeah. yeah. Surely, like surely, and coming back to that World War One, World War Two period where we, be- it was called shell shock, wasn't it? post-traumatic yeah, stress yeah. disorder what we would like what we would call PTSD yeah today. which is which would be obviously like um for example I know my grandfather when he was alive couldn't stand fireworks because it was a trigger for mm-hmm. him obviously he fought yeah. in World War Two. you know that sound yeah, makes complete sense I would that's PTSD in my mind like but yeah. at the time they didn't have that vocabulary um where was I going with this? Yeah, so it sort of begs the question, like, of course, there is more, quote, unquote, mental health because we didn't have the concept of it back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, just yeah. its existence wasn't around. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as well, like, like suicide is the biggest killer of vets, like people well. who come back from war. Well, right, yeah. the biggest like if you look at like how many um, Aussies died in Iraq, yeah, it's I think it's it's below a hundred, yeah. And then if you look at how many of them committed suicide, it's wow. hundred. That's you know so, so I, sad. Like I deal with parents and grandparents regularly, mm. and this is cultural too. Mm-hmm. Who say mental illness isn't a thing? Wow, they don't need therapy. I'm not medicating my child. And no. as, like, my role is to advocate for the child, right? So if sure. I'm like, this kid is suicidal. Like, I literally yeah. had this recently. Your child is suicidal. I need you to take them to the hospital. Yeah. No, I'm not going to do that. We'll work it out as a family. Like, mm. get out of here. Yeah. You know, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so it's kind of like I would far rather overdiagnose sure. and make sure that those people have support. This mm. doesn't mean medicate necessarily because that has, yes. like, a lot of side effects. Yeah. But what harm is it seeing a psychologist? Like mm. in Australia, we get 20 free psychology sessions a year. Yeah. That means you can basically see a psychologist every fortnight for free. Wow. Yeah. So tell me why that is a bad thing. Yeah. Like, no, you're oh, absolutely. It's like the of my existence. Yeah. And that must, and honestly, so that must just be so frustrating. And, and I think really what it will take is. Just more, talk, just more dialogue about it, right? Like listening to a podcast like this, putting this on social media, making sure people know that it's, it, first of all, like very soundly scientific mental health issues definitely exist. Let's just, yeah, that is 100%. not a myth, people. It's not just an opinion. But I sometimes think people like treat um, psychology almost like religious beliefs. You know, like you yeah. can't just decide can take it, or leave it, it exists. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's sort of not going to work that way. We sort of know. Um, that's funny. And also very serious. I think I think if anything, like, gets taken away from today's podcast, everyone deserves therapy, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like we're blessed, really blessed here in Australia to have free health care so it is more accessible to people. Yeah. My audience aren't all in Australia and that breaks my heart that yeah. people may not have access to that. But then at the same time, like where would you point people um, online free mm. content? Like I know that you're on TikTok, you're advocating for, for mental health. Um, where can people go to just like learn more if they don't have really access to question. therapy? All the places I know are like Aussie-based. 
I know, like, I know. Like, I sort of thought, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure about the states. Like, maybe I could do some research and give you it for, like, the show notes. But Yeah, beautiful. Like, for Aussies as well, we have a 24-7 um, counselling service. Two different yeah. companies do it, Kids Helpline and Lifeline. Yeah. And you can call them at any time of the day with any issue that you want. It's completely confidential. Mm. And they are professional counsellors on the end of that line yeah. for free. That's beautiful. Like, yeah and like usually like when people go through really distressing things that might be at two in the morning or it might be at 10 p.m and it doesn't have to be for you like you could have a friend going through something they've told you something and you're really scared yeah give them a call yeah um i assume that they would be similar places in In other countries maybe some of your followers could like let us know yeah actually um, that would be fantastic especially on the youtube if they could tell us yeah if you're like maybe just on your on the comments if you can state which country you're in and then some resources that would be incredible um i think as well like i know for for a long time when I was younger and for me my mental health journey really began when I had kids and I had kids very young um that and that's due to my cultural our cultural upbringing um I think for a, about a year I had this mentality like you were sort of saying like oh I'm stronger than this or like mm. you know seeing for some unbeknowns reason that well actually no I do know where it comes from it it comes from the culture and upbringing and generational passing down that for that you know people strong people don't complete bull I'm calling it it's complete bull 100% every I believe now and this is my personal opinion that strong and intelligent people are able to recognize that it's the human condition we all have a mind we all have thoughts and everyone's exposed to being a human being and it's natural to go through mental health struggles. Um, Mm. What's your sort of, like we're heading up to an hour here. So I want to just like kind of wrap up and let you kind of give your last thoughts or whatever, or like, yeah, if you could say something to sort of summarize (laughs) what we're going to talk about, last thoughts. (laughs) I think last thoughts. I think like going back to the history of psychology, Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a relatively new practice, you know. It's yeah. only two hundred years old. Yeah, people have freaking had books for longer than two hundred years. Yeah, yeah. But I think just like medicine is advancing, and things that would have killed us two hundred years ago can be solved with an antibiotic or penicillin. Mm. Yeah. So can we be, I guess, treated and be made more well? Because I think it's yeah. a good spectrum of wellness by seeking treatment, and I think. That's a You're sitting there and thinking, I don't need therapy. That's a defense mechanism. Yes. And my question, I guess, for your followers is, why are you resistant? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I guess, something to ex- explore perspectively. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet you, I probably bet you all a hundred bucks, your parents are probably resistant to therapy too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's on Freud. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you uh, so much. That was beautiful. I want to, I will probably get you back on. Give up. What's your TikTok handle again? Psych with Brit? Brit. Cool. Okay. Well, I'll obviously have all of Brittany's socials tagged in here. Um, you can follow her on TikTok and Instagram, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Very little, but it's there. Yeah. No, I've been loving your um your psychology stuff on tiktok recently so yeah go go support the tiktok we love tiktok um and i will likely be requesting more time off you if you don't mind (laughs) i'd love to get you back here um and thank you so much i absolutely love today thank you for having me thanks so much thanks see ya